When I was growing up, I never thought that I would end up specializing in conflict. I left home actually when I was 13, and I used to ride horses, hunters, and jumpers. And I wanted to have a long career in riding horses, so I left and I moved in with my horse trainer who happened to live in Nogales, Arizona, on the border of Mexico. In Nogales, over the next few years, I was the minority. But in the horse world, when I traveled and, and showed horses, I was the elite. And over the next few years, I saw so much in the areas of social injustice, in terms of racism and discrimination, that by 17, I was very confused. I couldn't figure out why this was going on. And I wasn't sure what my role would be in terms of doing something about it. And then I was at that turning point. What was I supposed to do? Continue with the horses? or try and do something else, which I had no idea what that would look like. And I consider it divine intervention, but one day my lung collapsed. I had a spontaneous pneumothorax. And it actually, you know, reinflated all by itself, but I couldn't ride horses for six weeks. And it gave me this time to step back and think what was really important to me. And what I decided, because I was 17 and very idealistic, that this racism that I was, I was experiencing was just a big misunderstanding, that it would only take a few years to just go out and transform the planet, and then I could go back to the horses, which is where my life really wanted to go. So of course the joke is it's been 25 years since I've been on a horse, <laughs> and that is what has brought me here today. And so the issue that I wanna talk about, which I think is the singular most important issue in our time right now, is the lack of leadership. Now, we've just been through a heavy election cycle. You might be wanting to roll your eyes and say, wait a minute, have we not debated leadership ad nauseum over the past year or years? But what I want to present to you is what I consider a feminine approach to leadership, which is what I think is our call to action today. This is not my definition. It comes from the Oxford Leadership Academy. But we define leadership as that leadership is about relationships. And the conversation is the relationship. So if we, as individuals or collectively, or those of us who are in power positions, are not able or willing to come to the table and engage in conversation, are we leading? But this is easier said than done, right? I want to share a few things with you today about what I think is necessary to bring us to that table where we can have the conversation. And the first thing is that we need to put values first, not positions. Now, many of us, if I were to ask you right now, what are your core values? We all know what they are. We, all have, we also share many of them. We believe in respect, in terms of honesty, being trustworthy, um, valuing people is often even one of our values. But the test is not whether the values that we carry but how do we show up when our values are being compromised? For instance, when you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off, do you bless them or do you curse them? <laughs> that is real though. It's how we show up when our values are being compromised that will determine who we are today and will also determine our future. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was working in South Africa and I was training police. And at that time, South Africa was the murder and the rape capital of the world. And one day I had nine of the provincial police commissioners in the room, all men and me. And there had been this horrific case of a young girl, nine years old, she had taken the bus after school, got off the bus, and she was brutally gang raped. She had to be reconstructed from the inside out. And at nine, they did not know if she was going to be able to keep her uterus. So I decided to turn to these guys and I said, okay guys, here's a case. What are you going to do? The first response in the room was, where was her mother? If her mother had been there when she got off the bus, this would have never happened. So as a woman, <laughs> I had a few feelings about that statement and a few things I would have loved to say in that moment, very choice things. But I realized that what he was giving me was his position. I didn't know what the values were that led him to feeling that way. So my mantra whenever I'm feeling emotionally hijacked is to say, tell me more. And that gives me a chance to center, breathe, and be able to hear and go deeper with whoever I'm talking to. So in that moment, I turned to this group of men. I said, okay, tell me more. And then the next man said, well, it's because her, her mother worked. If she didn't work, she would have been there and the girl would have been safe. And then another man said, you know, my wife is also in the police, but I won't let her go to workshops or seminars because if she makes more money than me, if she gets promoted, we can't be married. And then another man said, he slammed his fist on the table and he said, gender equity, that is what is destroying the fabric of this country. So again, I breathed, <laughs> took a deep breath, turned to my mantra, and I said, tell me more. What is it about gender equity that you feel is so destructive? And they said to me, and this is where the real stories came, and this is where the value connection came. And they talked about being a person of color during the apartheid years, and as a man who wanted to be the protector of their family, 
they had to bow in submission to another person because of the color of their skin. They could not protect their children from being ridiculed or their wives or their, or their families and extended families. So when apartheid was over, because women all over the world had been the most oppressed, gender equity was a major focus. But now a lot of these men felt like, well, if I go up against my wife, my, my, my wife will get the job, but I won't. And they're feeling even more emasculated post-apartheid. Now, it didn't matter if I agreed or disagreed or I, I could debate on every issue. That wasn't the point, because that would be going back to positions. The only way to move the conversation forward was to think about what were our shared values. And as a woman, I want to be valued. I want to have a place at the table. I want to be able to take care of my family. I want to be respected. And so I led the conversation from there, and then we moved. And what's interesting is that documentary filmmakers know this technique. Have you ever watched a really contentious documentary film? And the first act is, you know, is usually someone saying, very justified and defensive, this is why I did it, and I was right to do what I did, and this is just how it is. But when the filmmaker stays present, doesn't judge, doesn't get into a debate, and just says, tell me more, they move into the second act, which is, huh, maybe this is how I see it. They start to reflect. Maybe there's some other ways of looking at the situation. So then we can move impossibly into the third act, which is where the person will often say, you know, maybe my way wasn't always the right way. And maybe there could be some other possibilities. But we cannot get to that third act if we're gonna put positions and judgments and make each other defensive. We have to connect on our values. And I consider men and women, especially in this context, the best metaphor I've ever heard is that men and women are like two wings of a bird. And a bird cannot fly with just one wing. And in today's world, we get so extreme in our positions that we forget that we are really a bird of humanity that is looking to fly. In this country, I look at Democrats and Republicans as two wings of America's bird. And if we don't come to the table and work together, our bird is gonna crash land, okay? In, in the Middle East, Israel, Palestinians, two wings of a bird. And even more recently, I would actually argue that the US and Iran are two wings of a bird. And lately, that's been one for me that's been really sitting heavy in my heart because I work a lot in the Middle East. And I've had nights where I've stayed up, and I have heart palpitations and anxiety wondering, are we going to World War III? Is it inevitable? Can we find a peaceful solution? Well, just before Thanksgiving, I happened to be working in Bahrain, a tiny Gulf country that's been in crisis since 2011, and I've been doing reconciliation work there. And I happened to be there during the um, most important Shia Islamic holiday, and it's called the Morning of Muharram. And if you're not familiar with, the, with how history goes, is that Imam Hussein, was the prophet's grandson. And during that time period, the government forces at that time wanted to see him dead. And so, as history depicts it, he and 72 of his closest followers and family were willing to meet an, a mass of an army of 30,000 strong, knowing that they were gonna be assassinated, knowing that they were gonna be beheaded. And so every year, for 10 days, in Shia Islam is this most important holiday to commemorate and remember and mourn the sacrifices man gave. And so as my friends, I had very dear Shia friends who took me into the city at night to experience these celebrations. And they said to me, and they said, you know, this is what the West does not understand. It is the spirit of Imam Hussein who lives within us. There is no power, no matter how big, who we will ever allow to dominate us. There is no one who can, no matter what weapons they have, that are going to bring us down. We are not afraid to die. In that moment, my heart starts racing. I started having palpitations, a panic attack is going, and I'm thinking, we're destined for war. We're gonna have World War III. Where can I move? What island's gonna be safe? Where can I take my child? And then I got centered again, and I went back to my mantra, and I asked them, I said, so tell me more. Tell me more about what makes, for you, Imam Hussein so sacred. And he just looked at me so, so you know, and very easily just said, he sacrificed. He sacrificed his life so that we could live. Immediately, I felt relief. I could identify with sacrifice, the value of sacrifice. As a mother, I would gladly sacrifice my life so that my children could live, or my child, I have one child, my child could live. As a country, we have a voluntary military that is willing to sacrifice so that we can continue our way of life. You know, Israel, Palestinians are willing to sacrifice their lives for future generations. That is a value that we can connect with. And if we can connect on that value, we can connect on other values as well. But we need to be able to bring these values to the table and talk about them, not our positions. Otherwise, we will never be able to have the conversation. 
But something happens, especially when we're scared, when we get emotionally hijacked, when we get angry, when we feel like we are being threatened in any way. And as a good person, we have this thing called a conscience, right? Unless you have a neurological pathology going on, most people have a conscience. So as a person, as a good person, we don't just hate or, or feel anger or dislike another person. That would not work with our conscience. So we have to dehumanize and demonize in order to hate. When I used to work in domestic violence, I never heard a man say, yeah, I went home and I beat my wife, Sally. No, it was, I beat that slut, I beat that hoe. Sally was a woman. Sally could have been the, the, the mother of his children, but a hoe, a slut, she was nothing. When I worked in Rwanda, the Hutus referred to the Tutsis during the genocide as cockroaches because no one can think about killing somebody's mother, son, infant child, grandmother, grandfather. But we can kill a cockroach. You know, and, we, and when you, and you kill a cockroach, you want to take out the entire nest. The other day I was watching TV and I was watching the news and one of those like, news bars came across and it said, U.S. drones have killed over 2,000 terrorists in 2012. Since 9-11, terrorists, terrorists has become the slur of choice. It's how we dehumanize the other, the one that scares us and makes us afraid. Which leads into my final point, which is one is that we can never come to the table unless we're going to talk about values. But we have to see each other as people, not objects that can be dehumanized and demonized. But again, because we have this thing called a conscience, and we all have it, is that a good person doesn't just dehumanize or demonize, we have to feel morally justified in how we feel. So how do we get that moral justification? And I call it, we build armies. We go around, we talk to our friends, our family, our coworkers, and we find out, hey, you know those people? You feel that way, I feel that way, great. If they feel this way and I feel this way and the news is telling me that what I'm believing and thinking is true as well, then I am morally justified in my position we are no longer talking values. We are back into positions. And now we hold on to them because we have a moral justification as to why we are right. But if leadership is about relationships and the conversation is the relationship, we are not gonna be able to go to, into the conversation unless we put values first, unless we see each other as people, not objects who can be dehumanized. And we need to work on solving problems. It is not about being right. No matter how we feel, we are morally justified. So my commitment here to you today is that I am willing to do the work that is necessary for me to be able to come to the table and have the conversation, to lead within my circles of influence. But this is deep personal work. It's for us to do, for you, for me, for us individually and collectively. And so my invitation to you is, will you choose to lead with me? Thank you.